Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2014 Significance Lecture. I'm Brian Tarran. I'm the editor of Significance magazine, and it gives me great pleasure to be here today to introduce Tim Harford as our guest speaker. Tim, of course, is someone who needs very little in the way of introduction. I think for most in this room, he'll be familiar uh, from his Radio 4 show, more or less. He's the author of uh, Financial Times columns and of several excellent books, the latest of which is The Undercover Economist Strikes Back. Now, when I joined Significance back in June, I was delighted when I was told that Tim uh, had accepted the Royal Statistical Society's invitation uh, to speak and to deliver this year's lecture. For me, I think Tim is a role model for what we want to achieve with Significance. And I say role model for two reasons. Firstly, he has an enviable ability to take statistical ideas and to discuss them and present them and communicate them in an engaging and informative way, which isn't always easy. And secondly, speaking as a journalist, he has a, a frustrating knack for writing the sort of articles you wish you could write yourself. Now, I remember reading one of those articles earlier this year. Uh, in it, Tim warned that we shouldn't forget the important statistical lessons of the past as we rush to embrace the big data future ahead of us. And Tim will be expanding on those ideas in his talk today titled The Big Data Trap. So please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Tim Harford. Great pleasure to be here. As, as a child, I lived in Chesterfield. That, that's the one with the church they couldn't quite build properly, about 10, 15 miles south of Sheffield. And, and my father, who was a classical music fan, used to, used to bring me uh, here to this room to, to listen to... Uh, to great performers uh, with tremendous skill, uh, really uh, astonishing the audience. So it's all changed now, obviously. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about big data. Uh, my, uh, my friend, the psychologist uh, Dan Ariely, uh, recently said about big data, he said it's like, it's like teenage sex. So no, everyone's talking about it. No one really knows how to do it. Uh, everyone claims they're doing it when they talk to other people. Everyone assumes everyone else is doing it. Um, I, I should add to that that uh, I guess, like teenage sex, I think I think you know big data has um, you know it, th th things have changed because of technology. I imagine teenage sex has probably changed because of technology, and and big data has changed because of technology. But at the same time, and I, this is the really the central theme of what I want to talk about this afternoon. At the same time, it hasn't changed that much. I think the same, uh, the same opportunities and the same uh, howling mistakes that were, were always there, they're still there, they're still important, and we, we shouldn't forget about them just because the world now contains iPhones. Uh, and what, one more similarity with, with teenage sex is basically it's, it's not really something I know anything about, and yet somehow I find myself asked to discuss it with you. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um, now, I, sh I should say, uh, by way of preamble, uh, what I mean when I say big data, because of course it's just one of those uh, buzz phrases that is very widely used by you know, people with, with something to sell, um, people who are trying to sort of catch on the, the bandwagon. Um, Different people mean very, very different things when they say uh, big data. So, so what I'm not talking about uh, is uh, machine learning on these super large uh, data sets. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is very interesting. I don't really understand it. It's, it's a standard. It's understand it. It seems like a sort of witchcraft, um, but it's very exciting. So the, the idea that you can, you can feed a, a corpus of translations into a computer, and if that corpus is big enough, the computer will start being able to translate English to French, French to Latin, Latin to Klingon. Uh, and it, it, is, it is astonishing, even if I, I, am, I am now told that one of the problems with Google Translate, which is the most famous example of this, is that a lot of the pages on the internet that Google Translate is, is slurping up uh, were created using Google Translate. So there's sort of weird circularity going on now. But clearly, that, that's an amazing achievement. Microsoft Connect, uh, interpreting these sort of strange signals that you make as you're playing these computer games. Um, that's, that's machine learning on big data, absolutely remarkable. Voice recognition, um, a, a story I read uh, just last week in uh, New Scientist about this uh, supercomputer in San Jose. The system's called uh, KNIT or NIT, K-N-I-T. 
um, which stands for something to do with knowledge. Uh, the supercomputer which, which read 100,000 scientific papers uh, in a couple of hours and then tried to figure out what those scientific papers were all about and deduced that from this body of scientific papers that there were a couple of important enzymes out there that might be useful in treating cancer and uh, also detected, analyzing scientific papers up to 2003, also detected uh, a bunch of enzymes that it, it predicted must be out there and in fact they had been discovered by scientists since 2003. The supercomputer just sort of said, well, um, Judging by my, literature, my, my reading of this enormous scientific literature, I think they're out there. So th th this is absolutely amazing stuff. I don't really know how it works, but um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to diss that today. I'm going to diss something else. Uh, I, what really interests me is this, the opportunities and the threats of what you might call found data. So it's, it's out there. It's out there because smartphones are pinging a mobile phone masts. It's out there because people are typing searches into the internet. There's all this data out there. And because it's so cheap to gather, um, and because it's so, so rich, there's so, much, there's so much there, it's interconnected in all kinds of interesting ways, we see an opportunity. We see an opportunity to analyze this data and to learn something. And clearly, there is a tremendous opportunity there. Um, but I think there are also some concerns, and, and that's some of, the th some of these concerns I'm going, to, I'm going to air today. So uh, probably the most famous example of this is Google flu trends. Can I, can I just check? Has anybody not heard of Google flu trends here? A few f not heard of Google flu trends? Okay, great, excellent. That means I'm going to say something new and exciting, and I'm, very, I'm really pleased about that. So Google Flu Trends uh, was announced five years ago by researchers at Google.org, which is the sort of nonprofit arm of Google. And it's based on an analysis of search terms. And what Google Flu Trends was aiming to do was to track the spread of seasonal flu across the United States. So how many cases are there and, and where are those cases? And what the researchers announced in a paper in Nature five years ago was that simply analyzing what people typed into Google, they could deduce where these seasonal flu cases were. And they could do it just as accurately as the Centers for Disease Control. And they could do it much faster. So they could do it with a 24-hour delay, whereas the Centers for Disease Control data took at least a week and often two weeks to gather. So this is an absolutely remarkable achievement. And it was interesting in a number of other ways. So, so one of the things that was interesting about Google Flu Trends was that it was, it was theory free. So there had been a, an earlier researcher who had studied Yahoo search terms. This is back in the day when people used Yahoo. Uh, so it's a while ago. And he had this idea that people would search for certain things. They might search for fever, or they might search for flu symptoms, or they might search for pharmacies near me. There were various things they might search for. And so he, he looked for those search terms, and he correlated them with flu cases, and he found, yeah, yeah, there is a correlation. And the Google researchers didn't bother with any of that. They had no theory as to what the search terms might be, other than there's probably going to be something. So they just looked at their top 50 million most popular search queries. And they have a long data set of these search queries being typed in and exactly where they were typed in. They have a long data set um, from the Centers for Disease Control uh, as to where the flu was reported. And they just looked at these historical correlations. And they found this very, very good fit. And they were able to start projecting that forward with tremendous accuracy. So that, I think, really, really gives a sense of the opportunity here. Now, we've got potentially, th this data is, is almost free. It, it, it's not being collected for any epidemiological purpose. It's just being collected because people type stuff into Google a lot. And yet, you can provide this incredibly fast uh, and accurate account of where the flu cases are. So this is a promise of, uh, the, the promise of found data. Um, so it, 
Google Flu Trends became almost, almost sort of the, the, the poster child for found data and the analysis of found data. And so these excitable articles appeared saying, now what can science learn from Google? Uh, and ideas that you know, completely theory-free data analysis was the future. Um, ideas that big data could provide incredibly accurate results. Ideas that um, you know, correlation was back in. You know, all this stuff about causation. Ah, you know, who worries about causation these days? It's, it's sort of philosophically problematic, and it's hard to identify causation. So let's just go for correlation. Much, much easier. Um, uh, the, this book by uh, Ken Kukier uh, and Victor uh, uh, Berger-Schonemeyer, Big Data, published a couple of years ago, says you know, causality is going to be knocked off its pedestal as you know, the basic idea of meaning in the sciences. Um, so at the end of theory, the idea of accuracy, the idea that correlation is, uh, is probably enough, and also the idea of something that, that is called n equals all. So how big, how big's your sample? You know, n equals one, a, n equals ten, n equals hundred thousand. Forget that. N equals all. We got all the data. Google didn't take a sample of search terms. They didn't have to take a sample of search terms. They could just look at all the search terms. So what's the problem? And that, of course, makes a bunch, a lot of kind of really old-fashioned questions about sample bias completely go out of the window. A very interesting, very interesting idea, very promising idea, very exciting idea. And then, about a year ago, Nature reported rather sad news, which is that Google flu trends had been sort of running down a bit like a, like a clock that hadn't been wound up, and it was, it was going further and further off the results that were coming out of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and it didn't seem to be really being maintained. I mean, this is one of the things. You know, Google did it and set it up, and there you go. And then it just went completely crazy. And it was over-predicting flu uh, by, by a factor of two, which for something that was supposed to be super, super accurate, I mean, I can probably do better than over-predicting flu by a factor of two just by looking at whatever happened last winter. I mean, suddenly, this amazing glimpse of the future it was all slammed shut, and the whole thing collapsed. So why? Well, I think one of the interesting things is we don't know why Google flu trends broke down, which is a, should, for a start, be a, be a warning about the use of these found data sets. We don't know why, because this analysis was performed by Google, and Google are not going to let you see their top 50 million search terms. Um, there are some theories. So one theory is um, there were several TV stories about the spread of seasonal flu. And so people, instead of typing such stuff into Google because they felt sick, they typed stuff into Google because they saw a scary story on the television. Another theory is Google's own sort of predictive text got you know, more and more accurate. So you would start typing stuff in, and Google was like, looks like you're searching for flu. Or Google would even, as you were typing in, Google would pop up. Um, I reckon you're searching for flu, and right now, before you've even finished typing, I'm going to give you uh, a whole box on flu symptoms or how to diagnose flu. Now, those changes in the way Google was, was sort of force-feeding information to the people who were typing into the search box, those changes weren't reflected in the Google flu trends uh, algorithm. So I think this gives us a little bit of a warning of, of, of some of the problems that are to come. Now, I should say, I'm sure Google Flu Trends is going to bounce back. You know, it can be recalibrated. The fundamental idea is still good. And I should also say that recent research suggests that if you take the Centers for Disease Control data and you combine it with Google Flu Trends data, you put the two together, even though Google Flu Trends data now looks very dodgy, you get a better predictor than just looking at uh, CDC data alone. So there's clearly, clearly something useful here. But it's a warning to us not to just go headlong and embracing this idea of found data. And, and this idea that all the old statistical rules can just be thrown out, they're for squares. You know, worrying about things like you know, causation, worrying about you know, how big's your sample and you know, what's your sampling. And forget all that. We, we mustn't do that. We mustn't lose track of these very, very old statistical lessons, because I think they still matter. Now, the most famous example uh, of, of big data, I think, 
is actually from 1936. Now, some of you will know already, just as I mentioned 1936, some of you will already get the guess what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, the Literary Digest's attempt to forecast the American presidential election, uh, Roosevelt versus Alfred Landon. Now, Alf Landon, the Republican challenger, uh, Roosevelt, the uh, Democratic president. And Literary Digest, very respected magazine at the time, decided it was going to carry out a polling exercise, uh, exercise of almost unprecedented scale. It was just breathtaking ambition. They were going to send out 10 million uh, cards to people, asking them to say which way they were going to vote in the presidential election. Uh, and you know, this is back in the day when uh, polling 10 million people was well, that was a big number back then, because the, uh, the the entire American electorate was only 40 million people. So you're going to you're going to sample a quarter of the electorate. You're going to try and sample a quarter of the electorate. And so Literary Digest posted out all of these cards, and the cards started coming back in, and the Literary Digest started writing up what they were learning, and they were tabulating their results, and cross-checking, and cross-tabulating, it was very exciting. And finally, about a, a month before the presidential election, having received almost uh, 2.5 million returns, this is, this is a lot, right? In 1936, this is a lot of returns. Having received almost 2.5 million, they, they announced their forecast of the result, which was that Landon was going to win by a landslide, um, which you, I don't know how up with American history you are, but I can assure you that it isn't what happened. In fact, embarrassingly, not only did Landon not win by a landslide, but Roosevelt won by a landslide. It's actually, and this is a two-horse race, basically. It's, it's kind of hard to be more wrong than the Literary Digest was. Uh, and in fact, they folded shortly afterwards. Um, correlation or causation, I don't know. But, you know, it would be, it's a bit depressing. You know, you, you, you've polled 10 million people and uh, you've predicted the vote share wrong of about 20 percentage points. It's not, it's not great. And just to rub salt into the wounds, um, there's this guy called George Gallup. I don't know what happened to George Gallup. Uh, the name <laughs> sounds strangely familiar. So George Gallup conducted a, uh, what he called an opinion poll. He's, he went out and sent some people out and interviewed some people. And he forecast the US presidential election result pretty well. Now, for every person George Gallup interviewed, the Literary Digest reached 800 people. Now, that, this is real big data. But of course, as you know, everyone in this room can figure out what went wrong. They got so obsessed with the size of the sample that they just completely lost track of the idea that they might, the sample might be systematically biased. After all, you're going to try and send out 10 million ballot papers. Where are you going to find 10 million people? Oh, well, you need to get their addresses. Where would you get their addresses? I've got an idea. The phone book and uh, automobile license registrations. So they, they, so they just mailed out 10 million cards to Americans who, at the depths of the Great Depression, owned a phone or a car, and were then somewhat surprised that this proved not to be an unbiased sample of the electorate. Um, there you go. But this is just a, it's a very, very simple reminder that you know, size isn't everything when it comes to the data set. You, what, you, what the Literary Digest achieved was an unbelievably precise estimate of the wrong number. Uh, Whereas Gallup had a you know, less precise estimate of something that was closer to the right number, because he was less worried about the size of the sample and more worried about trying to do something about sampling bias and trying to find a reasonably unbiased sample. These are old lessons, right? I, you know, I'm not even a statistician. I was taught this. Uh, so, uh, and yet, somehow, they seem to be forgotten. Now, now, you might say, well, hang on a minute. N equals all. We've got all the data. That's what, that's what we were told, big data. You've got all the data. You don't need to worry about sample bias if you've got all the data. Well, yes and no. So there's a, there's a fascinating uh, example of this from uh, the city of Boston, Massachusetts. They have launched this new app called Street Bump. I think this is a very, very clever idea. So Street Bump is a smartphone app. Boston has a big problem. They've got terrible, terrible weather, as you may know. Anybody here from Boston, Massachusetts? No? 
Uh, the weather sucks there, I can assure you. And because of that, it gets very cold in the winter. You've got a big problem with potholes. So this app, put it on your smartphone, and it connects to the GPS and the accelerometer on the smartphone. And you hit a, a pothole, and your phone pings a message to the Boston Department of Works and says, I just went over a pothole. You might want to send somebody out to take a look. And the Boston Department of Works, the Boston, Boston Department of Works are very, very pleased about this. They say this is a, this is a major influence on where we go and look for potholes and where we fix potholes. Uh, and oh, you think, well, that's a, that's a jolly clever idea. And then you go, well, are they, do they have all the data though they need from this, this, this data exhaust? They've, they've taken these people driving around with smartphones and they've turned it into a sort of data exhaust that they can mine to figure out where the potholes are. Um, well, yeah, they sort of have all the data. They have all the data of people who have smartphones in their pockets with this app loaded. They've got all that data. But what about all the people who are too poor or not sufficiently hip to have smartphones, or maybe who have smartphones but who haven't installed the Boston Street Bump app. They are all missing. And Kate Crawford, who is a researcher at Microsoft, uh, uses this, I think, as, a, as a, just a classic example of the way when you start using found data, it's really easy to just be seduced by the idea, well, we've got all the data. Well, you've sort of got all the data, and yet at the same time, there are people missing from your data set, and you you need to think very hard about who those people are. In the case of Boston, by the way, they did think quite hard about who's missing, and they, they took steps to correct. But very often, you see analyses that are performed with just this issue seems to be a total afterthought. I constantly see analysis of uh, sentiment on Twitter without anybody ever mentioning that not everyone is on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is a particular demographic. And you, you see uh, Twitter analyzed for, to predict, well, you know, where, where do people need help when Hurricane Sandy hit New York? You know, what, where needs help? What's, where are the problems? Twitter was being used for this. I mean, it's a terrific application. Uh, but as Kate Crawford points out, what the analysis of Twitter uh, showed was areas that had been mildly damaged by Hurricane Sandy. So if there was no damage, there were no tweets. If there was mild damage, then there were tweets. If there was severe damage, the population had been evacuated, all the cell phone towers had been blown down, and there was no power, and therefore there were no tweets. So <clears throat> you just need to be slightly clever about the way you use these data sets, and, and very often we aren't, because we, we are told, well, N equals all. You've got all the data. Uh, what is there to worry about? Um, now, of course, so, so far I've been talking about using data for, for the public good, for fixing potholes, for forecasting the spread of, of seasonal flu, for identifying victims of a hurricane. Um, but of course, a lot of people are very interested in big data, and particularly in found data, because they, they see an opportunity to make a lot of money. And, you know, who, and who doesn't want to make money after all? I'm an economist. I want to make money. Uh, by assumption, I, everyone else wants to make money too. Um, and thank you, thank you. Uh, so you, you could see this, the dollar signs light up on people's eyes when they read a remarkable article in the New York Times two years ago written by the journalist Charles Duhigg. And this article was, well, it was about various things. Well, one of the things it was, it was about was uh, the data analytics being used by Target. Now, Target are a, a discount a department store in the United States, very successful. And similar to the Tesco loyalty cards and all these other things, they, they have a loyalty card program and they collect data on the purchases that their customers are making. And again, it's a found data set. You collect this data because you're just recording purchases, but then you can start using it for other purposes. You can start using it for marketing purposes. Um, you can also start using it for deducing things about your customers. And so Duhigg says, well, one of the things that Target would love to know about you is whether you're pregnant. Because if Target can figure out that you're pregnant, Target can send you a whole bunch of discounts and offers round about the time your baby is due. 
Uh, and if you start to get in the habit of shopping at Target for your baby needs, for, for nappies, for baby clothes, and so on, that's a tremendously profitable segment. And th there's a window of opportunity there because all your shopping habits are changing at that point. So Target wants to get in there. So Target has a predict, uh, pregnancy prediction algorithm. And so Charles Duhigg uh, tells this story um, about a man who uh, goes into a Target store in Minneapolis, and he's furious, absolutely furious. He demands to see the manager. And the manager comes out, and this man says, you have been sending coupons and discounts for maternity clothes to my teenage daughter. What are you, you know, what are you trying to do? You're trying to encourage her to get pregnant? What, what sort of irresponsible mailing is this? And so the manager apologizes profusely and says, well, I'm, re I'm really sorry, sir. We've got, these, got this algorithm. Uh, you're, it's totally, totally inappropriate. Your daughter should never have received these mailings, and I, I do apologize to you and sort of takes the customer details and all this, and the man goes home, somewhat placated. And then a couple of days later, the, the manager phones him at home and says, sir, I just wanted to say uh, again how inappropriate it was that your daughter received these mailings. I wanted to apologize to you again. And the man says, well, actually, <laughs> maybe I owe you an apology. Uh, turns out there's some stuff been going on in this house that I wasn't aware of. So it's a fantastic story about uh, Target's computer knowing that this girl was pregnant even though her father did not know she was pregnant. And the, the power of data analytics, the power of this found data, you can sort of scrape it up from credit card records and purchase records and you can, you can see into people's souls and the deepest recesses of their private lives. And people got very, very excited about this. Obviously people said, wow, wow, they're making so much money, they can, we can make so much money with this. And other people saying, oh, it's a terrible invasion of privacy, you know, is nothing sacred. Um, and some journalists, quite a few journalists, I have to say, said, I don't believe a word of it. I think he made it all up. Uh, I have no idea whether he made it all up. Target said he got a number of details wrong. Well, that could mean anything. I mean, I don't know what details they may or may not have got wrong. It wasn't in, it wasn't in Minneapolis. It was in St. Paul across the river. I don't know. Um, and so I didn't know what to make of this story. And then um, my editor, more or less, said, well, first of all, is it, is it really that hard to predict that someone's pregnant? I mean, there are certain things that, like, for example, pregnancy tests <laughs> that you buy. Or if someone buys a bunch of pregnancy tests and then stops buying pregnancy tests and then starts buying um, folic acid, it's just not that hard. You know? And actually, almost anything else that you might want to forecast is a much harder proposition. But then um, uh, Kaiser Fung, who is the, the statistician for whom I have the I just think he's got the best name in statistics. So Kaiser Fung said, Kaiser Fung used to work in data analytics. He used to do this sort of you know, pregnancy prediction stuff. And he said, well, there's something more fundamental wrong with this story. We have no idea how many families received coupons for maternity wear where no one was pregnant. We don't know the false positive rate. For all we know, every single target customer in America received an offer off maternity dresses. And until you know the false positive rate, you have no idea whether you should be terrified by this story, amazed by this story, or just, meh, you know, who cares about this story? We just don't know. And Charles Duhigg, in telling the story, says, oh, well, the thing is, it, it's so uncanny, this algorithm, that Target will, will kind of mix stuff in, like uh, an offer for wine glasses. It'll put an offer for wine glasses in with the, with the pregnancy stuff, because if you were pregnant, you probably wouldn't buy wine glasses, and it would kind of throw you off the scent, and then because you wouldn't feel that Target was really, really creepy and knows everything about you. Yeah, well, maybe. And Kaiser Fung says, yeah, it could be. Or it could be Target doesn't really know whether you're pregnant or not and thinks maybe you might want a discount on wine glasses. Why not, why not offer that as well? That might just be a much better thing to do with the data. So you know, in, until we consider, and again, this is a really, really simple old statistical lesson. You know, I want to know the false positive rate before I'm going to be impressed by anything in your statistical analysis. Um, and missing from this very, very popular account of the power of found data. And there is a, 
Another very basic statistical lesson um, that applies to a lot of big data problems, which is the, the problem of multiple comparisons. You've got so many different hypotheses that you could test. Um, there is a very famous paper by uh, John Ioannidis, uh, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, that some of you will be aware of, which is basically a lot of that is about multiple comparisons. So I don't, we don't know how many hypotheses they tested. We also don't know how, my, how many uh, papers, how many experiments were done, research papers were done, where nothing interesting happened. They got, just got stuck in a desk drawer because we don't have a very good system for registering trials or registering experiments before they happen. I mean, the situation in, in clinical medicine is not that great. The situation in the social sciences is worse in terms of pretrial uh, registration. Um, you know, we, we just really don't know how, much, how many of these hypotheses have just emerged by pure chance. Now, my, my, um, my favorite explanation of multiple comparisons, you may have heard, have you, the, the jelly beans from XKCD, the cartoon? Some of you will have encountered it. So in this cartoon, uh, scientists test to see if jelly beans cause acne. And uh, P equals 0.05, uh, jelly beans don't cause acne. Then they, then they go, well, hang on, we should test different colors. So they test whether blue jelly beans cause acne. No, well, no, P equals 0.5, blue jelly beans don't, pink jelly beans don't cause acne, yellow jelly beans, yeah, and they just go through, and they go through 20 different colors of jelly beans. It turns out green ones do cause acne, and there's only a one in 20 chance uh, that, you know, it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just a great little explanation of the multi -com multiple comparisons problem. Now, of course, there are, this is a very naive way of, of testing for multiple, multiple comparisons. So we have many sophisticated statistical tools to deal with this problem. But those sophisticated statistical tools require A, training, and B, transparency. You need to really understand what was done to the data set and how many hypotheses there were out there uh, before you were you know, tested in a more sophisticated way. And of course, transparency is a real issue for a lot of these found data sets. Orange are not going to give you their data set. Tesco are not going to give you their data set. Facebook are not going to give you their data set. They might let you peek at bits of it. But we don't really know what's being done with these data sets. And so it's very, very difficult for us to know how to evaluate any of the statistical claims that emerge from them. So those, those, are, those are a few sort of classic statistical lessons we should all know, and we should all be able to apply to big data. And yet again and again, when I see big data being discussed in the media and by management consultants, uh, it, it's as though these lessons have never been learned, simply don't apply, uh, boring old school stuff. Uh, and I think that's a problem because they were hard to discover in the first place. You know, these were hard-won truths about statistics. It would be a shame to just throw them away because you know, now we have computers so they don't matter anymore. But I think there is also, um, there's, a sort of, there's another subtle problem with found data um, that I don't think we're sufficiently aware of. And yes, John, this is where I'm gonna talk about German forests. So the, the, the example that really sticks in my mind of this goes back to 1763 of, of, all, of all times. And the, the statistical problem that was being wrestled with at the time, uh, if you want to call it a statistical problem, I guess it is in a, in a, uh, a sort of a government statistics uh, sort of way, was trying to figure out how much timber were, was in these great German forests see these forests, they're very tangled, they're kind of messy, all kinds of different sorts of trees. And yet, for fiscal purposes, what you care about is, is the timber harvest that you could sustainably take out of these forests and still have a forest left at, at the end of it. That's what matters to the government. And so German foresters started trying to use some very, very basic statistical methods to estimate uh, how much timber was in the forest. And when I say basic statistical methods, I'm talking about something we call counting. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get too, too kind of complicated for you, but, um, but actually counting trees is not very easy. So what they did was, they, they, this was a guy called Johann Gottlieb Beckmann, hero of the German scientific forestry movement. And Johann Gottlieb Beckmann like, got all these guys, he lined them all up, and he, they had a Batman-style utility belt with these little leather pouches and colored nails in. 
and they walked uh, abreast of each other through a stand of, of trees. And they had five different colored nails. And so each tree they saw, they would evaluate as a particular sort of size, they'd been trained, and so they would, they would hammer a nail of the appropriate color to identify this particular tree. And you could see whether a tree had already been counted because it had a big colored nail hammered into it. And when these men had walked through this forest, at the, at the end of that process, you knew how large the area of forest was, and it seemed to be fairly typical. And uh, they'd come out and they'd count the nails, and they'd figure out how many trees and how big they were. Uh, and that, that, was, that was the beginning of trying to, trying to sort of uh, count the, the timber in this forest, to measure the timber in this forest. And the statistical methods got more and more sophisticated. So uh, there was a whole branch of mathematics called xylometry. Xylometry, I'm not making this up, this is true. So xylometry is all about estimating the volume of trees. And it involves calculus and sort of experimental work. You chop trees up and you kind of dunk them in water to measure the volume and all this, all this sort of stuff devoted to, to figuring out the, uh, the harvest will yield in these forests. But here's the, here's the point that, that concerns me, which was that the next step on this journey uh, was after the government bureaucrats saw these amazing maps and statistical tables showing how much timber was in the forest, all in terms of completely normalized, standardized trees. And then they started reimposing that statistical logic back on the forest itself. So slowly, over decades and decades, the trees came to resemble, the forests came to resemble the statistical tables. They came to resemble the map. So these foresters would start planting trees of a you know, particular, uh, a particular um, species at a particular time in nice straight lines. They'd clear away all the underbrush. And eventually, these forests became plantations, and the plantations looked exactly like they were supposed to look on the map. They looked exactly like the statistics that had been gathered about them. So if you look at a statistical account of an old growth forest versus a statistical account of the new plantation, they look the same. They look the same because everything you're measuring there, it's, it's all the same. You've got a certain weight of timber, a certain age of timber, certain bits, it's all there. But if you actually go to the plantation, you see a totally different uh, space. So this, the, the power of the state using statistics had really changed the landscape. And these plantations were, economically speaking, tremendously successful. They had fantastic yields. Um, and they weren't, they weren't bothered by you know, peasants rooting around for saps and firewood and stuff like that, because all that stuff had gone. Um, so, from the narrow point of view, the forest was actually a, a more successful place. Uh, from the broader social point of view, people who really counted had been excluded from the forest. Stuff that they valued about the forest wasn't measured. And because it wasn't measured, it just withered away. Nobody, nobody cared about this stuff anymore because it wasn't, wasn't on the statistical table, wasn't on the map, didn't matter at all. And this is a pattern that we, we've seen at other times in human history. Perhaps the most uh, notorious example is of redlining in uh, government maps. And these were federal government maps in the United States of these great American cities. So the, the federal government agency which produced these maps was trying to lend money to people who wanted to borrow uh, at the, high, the height of the Great Depression, the depths of the Great Depression, they wanted to remortgage their houses and get a mortgage that had a long-term interest rate. They weren't, weren't going to be foreclosed upon. This was a great government program and very, very successful of helping people at the depth of a financial crisis remortgage their homes, helping communities stay together. But the whole process was guided by this, these statistics that had been gathered on different areas and it had been placed on a map. And they basically said, we are not going to lend uh, mortgage money to this particular part of the city. It's, and it's behind the red lines. It's all colored in red. We'll, we'll lend money to you if you live here. We'll lend money to you if you live here. We'll lend money to you if you live here. We won't lend money to you 
if you live in this part of the city. And of course, as we, as we know, these lines were often un ultimately drawn on racial, uh, on racial grounds. So you had these statistical tables that had been drawn up initially to measure the world, transforming the world. And the idea that you know, you're not, there'll, there'll be no loans, there'll be no, uh, no loans for home improvement, there'll be no loans for mortgages, there'll be no loans for setting up a new business because this area is a ghetto, because this area is a slum. Of course, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In the end, just as with the forests, there's, there's just nothing left there except what the statisticians have gathered and what the, the government uh, decision makers have decided are, uh, are important. Now, this sort of thing's been going on for a very long time. Now we have data coming from our smartphones. Now we have data coming from our web searches. Now we're going to have you know, spectacles and overcoats and all, all kinds of things that ping data all over the place. Um, we need to guard against this. It seems now that we're able to measure everything. We can see everything in terms of computers, we can turn everything into numbers, and we can apply statistical methods to everything. And, and we need to be wise enough to know that that's always an illusion. You know, we can never have all the data. We can never gather numbers on everything that matters. And the very same opportunity that comes from being able to quantify, being able to measure, being able to, to, to gather more and more data, the more we're able to do that, the more the risk is that we forget what's not on the map, we forget what's not in the data set, we forget what's not on the statistical charts. It's our responsibility as people who care, both about numbers, but also who care about making the world a better place, not to fall into that trap. Thank you very much for listening. Very happy to take questions. If you do have questions for Tim, if you raise your hand, a roving mic will uh, come and find you. Uh, Jane Hopkins, University of Warwick. Thank you very much for <clears throat> an excellent discussion. One of my concerns is that I agree with you, and that's a concern because, of course, the danger is that statisticians yet again come across as negative. And my view is a lot of the reason we have things like data science or omics and so on is that people hope that they give it a new name, the statistical rules won't apply. Um, but that's why I think, I think your second message is very important, if, if you like the warnings, and if we can try to put those warnings positively. Um, I used to rather enjoy pointing out to the person at Warwick University who wanted to measure things, who was a classicist, that a certain chap called Aristotle had mentioned the problems with this about two and a half thousand years ago, and said there's nothing so ignorant to somebody who imagines that everything can be measured in the same way. Um, and I think that is something that as statisticians we have to keep saying, you cannot measure everything in the same way. Um, I do have a small question. Did they count the trees by counting the number of nails left in the pockets or by the number of nails hammered in? They, uh, I, I sense a supplementary question. They, um, <laughs> but yes, by, by counting the number of nails that remained, that's how they did it. Okay, all right, you're gonna to have to explain to me why that, can, why that matters, but uh, there's, uh, um, but yes, that's how they did it. Um, it's, it's, by the way, it's a fascinating example from a book uh, by uh, the uh, social scientist James Scott, the political scientist James Scott. The book is called Seeing Like a State. Wonderful, wonderful book, and it kind of, he opens up, uh, uses the German forest as an example of how this kind of attempt to make the world make sense to state actors immediately starts to change the world. And it's not, of course, not just a, uh, a matter of data gathering, but that's, that is often how the state tries to make sense of the world. Uh, thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. Uh, my question is uh, not only about the big data, but also the attention given by media to the different data sources. I would like to give you two examples. One is uh, consumer price index. We statisticians make a very big sample representative. We check all methods. We are conservative. Then I work in an international organization, and to collect the data on CPI for the large number of countries is a very big challenge. 
In some country, it is politically sensitive, you know, from Argentina. But then economists produce this Big Mac index, data from one McDonald's company, and completely smash the validity of the data collected from such a huge uh, number of countries and so many households and expenditure. Second example is my organization is Industrial Development Organization, and we collect the manufacturing production data quarterly which uh, from the country that contributes 90% of the global manufacturing output. Before we publish the data, then comes purchasing managers index, which do not measure the production itself, it is only the perception of the managers which side wind might blow, that's all. And we have the exact, accurate, okay, you may question, accurate measure of the production and publish the data. So my question is, you are working in the media, how can we get media attention to our data that we are better and we are more accurate and the policy makers should use our data in our RSS written data evidence and decision so their data is not evident. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it, it's a really good question. Um, and it, it, it's, it, I think the, the Big Mac index is a really interesting example. Uh, I actually, I'm not too worried about the Big Mac index itself because uh, I think the way that the Big Mac index is usually presented by The Economist is uh, as a, a bit of fun and also an explanation of the idea behind purchasing power parity exchange rates, which are actually they're quite hard to it's quite hard to figure out what purchasing power exchange rates really represent and how they're calculated and so on. And the Big Mac is just a it's just a nice example of the uh, the way the way it uh, works. But you're absolutely right; it it captures a tremendous amount of attention. And why does it capture a tremendous amount of attention? Because you can put it on a simple chart. It looks, it's super, super easy to understand the output and how they calculated it. And, that's, um, and that is, of course, tempting for the media, partly because a lot of journalists don't know much about numbers. But even, even the journalists who do know a lot about numbers, they don't necessarily trust their readers to know much about numbers. Um, I was struck by uh, a comment made to me by an economic historian, Walter Friedman, about the early economic forecasting industry. The most successful early economic forecaster was a man called Roger Babson. And Roger Babson uh, was active in the United States, um, really from the, the early 20th century through to after the war. Um, he fascinated by Isaac Newton. In fact, he now, he, he, he bought the largest collection of Isaac Newton memorabilia outside uh, Cambridge and brought it to the United States. Um, and he had this idea that um, you know, every recession had an equal and opposite expansion. Every expansion had an equal and opposite recession, which sounds very scientific, doesn't really mean very much. But he produced these amazing looking charts, you know, lots and lots of jagged lines. They looked really cool. There was, there was quite a lot of data behind them. But fundamentally, he gave people an up arrow or a down arrow. He would say, yeah, the economy is going up or the economy is going down. And, and Walter Friedman, the economic historian, said people love that. They didn't want all these complicated statistics. They just wanted the up or the down. And, and I think that to catch media attention, ultimately, one needs to produce something digestible, something that can, can be understood uh, in a simple way. The purchasing manager's index see, is a very, very simple number. Um, I can see why that is not a very appealing uh, answer. Because you know, I've just been warning about, you know, the world's a very, very complicated place. We don't want to oversimplify. So that's the, that's the line we have to tread. Is there something, is there something that we can present that is, uh, that is easy to understand, uh, eye-catching, reason reasonably representative of the truth, and yet based, you know, really based on good, solid research? Um, Journalists won't get involved in the complexities. Most journalists won't get involved in the complexities. They don't trust their readers or their listeners to get involved in the complexities. But I think it is possible to present a simple number that at the same time represents really good, solid, hard work rather than just something, well, we phoned up some McDonald's and here's what we found. So thank, thank you for your question. Uh, hi, uh, I'm working on a big data project at the moment and you've brought up some uh, points which I've made myself, particularly the N is not all thing. 
Um, for future development, do you see the problems outweighing the opportunities in big data just becoming one of these things, or are we actually going to extract some sense out of it, if you see what I mean? Um, it's a good question. You're asking an economist for a forecast, and you're probably aware that you know, we're not very good at that. Uh, I, it seems to me it, it, there, there, there must be some vast opportunity here. There must be. When I think about um, how um, we think about economic data, so think about GDP data. So uh, uh, John was telling me this morning the ONS published their update of GDP data. We, now, we know, of course, that is incredibly rigorously done, lots and lots of hard work. Um, however, it comes out with a delay. It's subject to revisions. Um, it only comes out quarterly anyway. It's this, it's this big sort of um, pre-chewed aggregate that's tremendously well-behaved. Economists feel they know what this number represents. And you can look up GDP for any number in the, any country in the world, and you can get quarterly data going back in history, and you get this nice rectangular data set. Compare that with what we might learn about the economy if we had access to credit card records. So if, you, if, you, if Visa shared their data, you would see, in, almost in real time, where people are spending money, potentially, although Visa don't always have this information, potentially what people are spending money on, uh, you, you just you know, hour by hour. It, it, it's an absolutely, it, it seems just inconceivable that that data can't add to the sum of human knowledge, given that the state of the art at the moment is you know, quarterly GDP. There must be something that could be gained from that sort of data set. And yet at the same time, you, just, you think, well, gosh, not everyone has a Visa card. People don't use their Visa cards in the same way. There's a huge sampling bias problem. And we don't, really, we don't understand the sampling bias problem. We don't understand how it works. Or, or yeah, I, it's an incredibly messy data set. And yet it's so rich and it's so fast, there must be something we can gain from it. So it's, it's inconceivable to me that this sort of found data is not going to be very, very important. It clearly poses huge opportunities. Um, but not if, we, not if we just plow ahead as though um, none of the old lessons matter, because I think all of the old lessons still matter. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, gen gentlemen there. Could I just... Yes, right. Could I just give a little amusing anecdote in addition to some of the lovely stories that you told? Um, I live locally, so I had the benefit of listening to the 6 o'clock Today program to hear the latest instruction from the European Union from Brussels to Britain. That in common now with all the other 27 countries of the European Union, in our estimates, of our annual GDP numbers, amount of goods and services produced, we now have to guess an element of how much money is spent on illegal drug transactions, how much money changes hands with prostitution and any other sex activities involving money. Now, isn't that a wonderful scope for fiddling, guessing, and lying? Marvelous extra thing against big data. I, it, it's, it, I think it's a very, very interesting example. I, I, I would, I, I, I'm not going to put John on the spot. I mean, John's, <laughs> John's knowledge of uh, the sex and drugs trade uh, is, is, is vast. Um, but um, so I think it, this is one of those ones where I, I feel I see both sides of the story. Because on the one hand, it is, uh, and we know in the past, Greece you manipulated uh, the grey economy statistics. Uh, manipulated is a very strong word, but I think it's, I think it's probably justified in this case. I think we, we know that those data were manipulated to get Greece uh, into the Eurozone. Uh, there's a, there, that is ripe for statistical manipulation. Um, and of course, the Office for National Statistics, I mean, they just don't know that much about how much people are spending on prostitutes and, and on cocaine. You know, they try, but it's just harder than going down to Tesco. Um, and yet, at the same time, in principle, GDP is not a measure of um, the stuff we approve of. GDP is a measure of economic activity. And 
if, if people are paying for sex and pornography and heroin and cocaine, that is, that is economic activity, actually. It's not taxable, it's not legal, uh, or some of it's legal, some of it isn't, um, but it is economic activity. So I can, I can see why, in principle, you'd want to measure it, but I can also see that clearly it presents tremendous, um, tremendous challenges, to, to which I know uh, John and his colleagues will rise. Uh, <laughs> So um, we've got three more minutes, so I, I'm, going to go, I'm going to go to Heaton in the front row with apologies to everyone else, because I know that he will keep his question brief. Thanks for a crowd-pleasing talk on big data. You knew your audience here. But in a sense, there's a challenge back to the statistical community, which is what do we do about this, given the, kind of the trap that you've outlined? So can you say a bit about how we can rise to the challenge to help society use data for, for the good? Uh, thank you. I think clearly one of, the, uh, one of the things we have to do is just to uh, demonstrate clearly examples where mistakes have been made and with the appropriate statistical tools or the appropriate statistical uh, preparation, wisdom, insight, those mistakes would not have been made. So if you could demonstrate practical, uh, practical value of statistics, either good old-fashioned uh, O-level statistics like I'm talking about, or cutting the latest cutting-edge statistics, whatever. If you can demonstrate the practical value of that body of knowledge, that is, of course, clearly, clearly a first step. Um, one of the things that I, obviously has to be done, but I hesitate even to suggest it, because you're, I think there can't be any uh, body of academic professionals uh, you know, anywhere in the world who understands more about interdisciplinary working than statisticians. I, I, I think I'm safe in, in saying that, even though I don't have rig rigorous statistical evidence to prove it. But, and hence, we you know why I don't even need to say this, but a lot of it is going to be about interdisciplinary working. A lot of it is going to be about teaming up with the computer scientists or with the astronomers or with the uh, bioinformatics people or with, with anybody else who's, who's working with these large data sets. Um, teaming up with them, showing them that statistics has a tremendous amount to offer. Um, and I'm sure also learning from them, because just some, some of the, the sheer logistical challenges of handling very, very big data sets uh, are, you know, they're just not, they're not in the old statistics textbooks because no one ever imagined that data was going to get uh, quite this big and quite this hard to, to handle. But that's the thing, demonstrating that statistics has value, which shouldn't be hard because it clearly does, and uh, working across disciplines with, uh, with colleagues who are, um, have the data for various reasons, are using the data, have things they can do with the data, but maybe don't have that deep statistical knowledge. Um, but you, you accuse me of crowd-pleasing. Crowd you know, I know that I don't need to say that to the people in this room, but that seems to me absolutely fundamental. I mean, this is, this is um, statistics you know, have never been cooler. They've never been more useful. There's never been more opportunity to get it wrong, but also to get it right. So it just seems to me a, a, a wonderful time to be a statistician, and, and that, is, that is one of several reasons why I've been very, very flattered to come uh, be, be, be asked to address you this afternoon. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.